so when it came to the cinematography of the Man Who Saw the World, we definitely took a lot of risks. You know, the film is majority emulating a film stock, a black and white codec film stock, rather than going for colour, though, you know, it was shot in Monday, other than the final minute and a half of the film where we actually go into colour. And it was important for us to try and emulate noirs as much as possible due to the story of the film. Obviously, for those... Obviously, for those who've watched it, it, the noir turns out to be actually a figment of his imagination, a metaphor his own brain has come up with, having him as a hero, the centre of his own story, being this hero detective in the noir he's been watching, when that's not him, but that's how he's imagined this situation that he's actually in, is a noir, essentially metaphorically showing his life how it is. So we thought it was important to really match the look of the films from the 40s and 50s era as much as possible. So shooting the whole thing in black and white was very important to us from the start, especially also the camera moves. You know, we use a lot of dolly moves, static shots, because back then those big cameras, they couldn't be on a gimbal. They didn't have a helicopter to fly around. So it was really important that the shots we used matched that of an actual noir short film. And the transitions or another interesting thing, those were written into the script, they were always going to be match edits, so it was important that we framed up the shots on the day to match the other shots so they transitioned well using the movement as a way of selling the transition, so that was something that was always planned in the script, that wasn't a, hap that wasn't a chance in post, that was planned from the very early stages of pre-production a year before the film was actually made. So, as a cinematographer, what I look for in my team and crew is people that I've worked with before that I really trust to help me get across the vision we're trying to go for. We don't want to be messing around time, wasting time trying to communicate something to people that might quite not understand our style or process. I'd rather be on board with people that know this is how it's going to be, this is how we're going to light it, and they can get me to that point quicker than rather than having to go and do it myself and having a, a team that's just, you know... Exactly that. Okay, so The Man Who Sold the World was a short film and was always written to be a 10 minute film due to the confines of festivals. It was made to be a short film in festivals because of budget reasons. We had a around £1,100 of budget, which is one of the biggest budget shorts we've ever done. And stretching £1,100 to a feature length may be possible, but with hiring actors, the gear, locations, you know, we would have run out very quick. And we wanted to make something short that told the whole story, which I feel Man of Soul World does very strongly in its 10 minutes, rather than overstay its welcome and be 120 minutes or so. So it's 10 minutes because it can tell the story in 10 minutes. And if it was any longer, you know, it'd just be lingering about the story, you know, and also just the whole budget restraint. So that's why we went with 10 minute, 10 minutes. We knew we could make it look as cinematic as possible in that time scale using things like Stanley Kubrick's house of the film was we could afford that in the ten minute short, but trying to use that for you know a feature, having to have multiple days there, we would have run out of budget very quickly, same with the actors. Right, the purpose of a film to me is all about story and characters and how characters can overcome obstacles in any given situation the power of you know the human spirit I know not every film is about humans it sucks but it's always very human emotions cast onto objects for example Toy Story they're toys but they're taking on very human characteristics and qualities and same with like Lion King where they're animals but they're taking on very human stories of you know classic tales that we've been telling for the last couple hundred years in writing and I feel the purpose of the film is really to be a visual and auditory experience of telling these stories. So that's the purpose of the film to me. So two elements that make a good film, I feel I've just gone over them, but really it's story and characters. It's so important that a good story that will keep the audience gripped, gripped from the beginning 
you know, and characters that make you feel, that make you emote, that make you want to care for them or hate them, for example. You know, as long as you get your audience to feel something other than not liking the film, obviously. I feel those are the two strongest points of a film. So when shooting a period piece, you've got some massive challenges that you don't normally have. You shoot a modern day drama, you know, in the streets, Car, modern cars can be there, houses, how they look, etc. You know, you don't have to worry about all that. That can just be part of the film. That's because it's a set in modern day. You don't have to worry about that. As soon as you're doing a period piece, every single item that characters wear, every single costume piece, every prop they interact with, every location has to look like it was made then. It can't look modern day. If a character suddenly has a, a modern watch or a smartphone, then it takes you out of the immersive experience of a film. You know, the immersion is broken and the the disbelief of the audience is just, they're gone. They're not going to watch it. They're looking at the watch. They're not noticing what the characters are saying, what they're doing. So it's very important to get that right. And that's what makes the period piece hard. You have to spend a lot more time and money sometimes. You can, you know, there's ways of doing it all for cheap, but you got end up having to put a lot more time to getting all the locations, scouting them out to make sure that they look time appropriate. And a lot more time post making sure that, you know, oh, a modern car didn't go past your shot. You know, PVC, modern plastic windows aren't shot. They're all actually from the time. If you have a car in the film and then you've got to try and rent an old-fashioned car, you know, bring in classic motors, that becomes expensive. So it's definitely a big challenge, and that's what makes period pieces so hard because you're working twice as hard in costume and locations as you normally would be. So I feel The Man Who Sold the World should win just because of how much love and time and spirit went into the film and how much of a struggle it was to create. Every step of the way we had people telling us this story doesn't make sense, why would he do this, he should cheat on his wife and telling us all things that just like that's not our story we want to tell and people telling us that this is wrong and we just struggled to make it because everyone, it felt like everyone was out to get us, everyone wasn't there to support the film but more attack it, bring it down. So it would be a great opportunity for my team and me to be able to win this, just to say that we got through, we did it, and that we made the story we wanted to tell, and to take it further and develop it into places we never expected before, you know, expand on the story, and I feel it'd be a great opportunity for me and the team, and it would be a very good stepping stone in our careers to getting to where we want to be working in the industry as cinematographers and directors. So what do I feel is the most important quality in a film director? I think it's collaboration, listening to everyone, the crew, the cast, anyone who's got an idea, even if it's a runner, just listening to everyone and knowing when to collaborate, not to be this single figure of I am in charge, I am the power, I'm a dictator, you're a director, you know, you're there to make the film as good as it can be, you're there to get put across a vision, but not to ignore others' visions, and I think that's important. You don't want to be working with someone that you can't put across ideas to, or you feel too intimidated to do that. You want someone that you can just communicate with and know that they'll be friendly and kind to work with and don't, won't go into a rage and shout and scream at the actors for not getting the form they want, they'll talk gently to them and coach you along that's what you want someone more nurturing rather than some dictator i think that's the most important quality so it's that collaborative and kindness if i could go back and give myself any advice i would tell myself to keep going to ignore all the because a lot of people out there, you know, there's a lot of people trying to help and develop your script and give you ideas at work, but there's a lot of people that just do want to bring you down, and it's learning to filter that out. So I'd definitely say just to ignore all that hatred we got, all that negativity towards the film, what we were trying to make, and just to keep going, even if every festival rejects you, like we had a lot of rejections, just to keep going, you will find something. And I feel like I probably have followed that advice now, considering it's being entered into way more, but... That's definitely something I'd tell myself 
and to check what the sound mix is doing because we have some patchy sound bits, but that's what I'd say. Oh dear.